Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 184. This week the questions are taken from the Wednesday video on the two USS Hornets, obviously that being CV-8 and CV-12, the two World War II era ones, and Guide 234 on USS Minneapolis CA-36. So let's begin with questions. Patrick Donnelly asks, if the US Navy in the 1930s decided to take a quality over quantity approach when designing Yorktown and Enterprise and built them to the 27,000 ton limit, with the treaty tonnage used up, how would it affect the development of Wasp, Hornet and the Essex class? Well, Wasp almost certainly is not going to exist because Wasp was designed to use up the remaining tonnage left in the US's treaty allowance tonnage limit for carriers. So if Yorktown and Enterprise are built up to 27,000 tonnes instead of the historical displacement of the Yorktown class, well, then there's no treaty-mandated tonnage left, so they just can't build it. When it comes to Hornet, then Hornet is probably going to be similar to how she was historically a repeat Yorktown with some modifications. She'll be a repeat 27,000 tonne Yorktown with some modifications, because that's the only way you're going to get a ship in the water quickly enough. Um, the depicted image by the way is not the 27,000 ton version of Yorktown they were looking at it's an alternate 25,000 ton they were looking at in the late 1930s but it gives some idea of roughly what it might have ended up looking like as far as the Essex class are concerned it's probably not going to affect their development too much because the Essex class were very much what would we like to build as a large fleet carrier that can that is still relatively speaking, small enough to be built in mass numbers, because, you know, in theory, there's nothing stopping the US designing something like the Midway a bit early. But one of the things that went into the Essex class design program was the desire to be able to churn out relatively significant numbers of the ships within something approaching a reasonable budget. And you're not going to pull that off with um, Midways, certainly not in that time period. So the Essex class probably ends up looking broadly similar to how they do historically. Maybe they might push the boat out a little bit and add another 500,000 tonnes or so, get them a little bit bigger. But I, I think the Essex is... Uh, the main thing you're going to see is that it, when the Essex class are sailing next to something like Enterprise, it's going to be much harder to tell the two apart. Lupum asks, what would most likely have happened if Enterprise and Hornet had continued their actual plan for the Doolittle raid and headed over the last 200 miles? Was there any likelihood for them to be spotted or even sunk by the Japanese? The most immediate and obvious effect would be that if they do launch at 400 instead of 600 nautical miles, the B-25s pretty much certainly will have the capability of actually making it to the bases they were supposed to. So the B-25s themselves actually survive somewhat intact, but that's probably somewhat secondary to, you know, the crews all making it out intact and not having to go through some of the experiences that they did historically. Now, as far as whether or not they might have been sunk, it depends on what they run into on that last 200 nautical mile leg. Obviously, historically, they managed to launch the attack completely by surprise. So if they don't encounter anything else and they launch closer in, then it's going to be pretty much same as it was. Because obviously the carriers are going to turn around and hightail it out of there as soon as the last B-25 is off the deck. So they're going to be well out of strike range by the time anything's scrambled to intercept them. But... Obviously, there is a possibility that they might run across something else in terms of Japanese shipping, which will actually get a clear signal off. And if that happens, it is entirely possible that the Japanese might dispatch something that might not necessarily sink them, but might certainly do damage. Uh, it's relatively unlikely that anything dispatched navally from anything that the Japanese had to hand would be fast enough to overhaul them given the lead that they'd have um, in time to act before, obviously, they they just get out of range. 
but Japanese aircraft certainly do have the range, well, actually, at either strike point to get to them. But obviously, again, if, let's say, they're spotted and then immediately launch and run, there's going to be time where the aircraft are covering distance, but also the carriers are covering distance further away from them. But a, a launch at, say, 400 nautical miles where they have been spotted at, during, so let's say, during the launch process, uh, maybe someone sees a B-25 and goes, hmm, where where's that come from? I should go and have a look. It's possible that longer-range Japanese strike aircraft might be able to launch some attacks on uh, a Hornet and Enterprise before they get out of air range. And then it's kind of up to luck of the draw how much damage that actually does. Josh Thomas Moore asks, In Drydock 140, you answered a question of mine about the domestic enemy of the Royal Navy, and you showed us a picture of a cancelled aircraft design. What was it called? That would be this aircraft, and this was an artist impression of what the proposed gull-wing, fully navalised Spitfire of 1938-39 could have looked like entering fleet air arms service probably in 4041 probably late 1940 so this is this is basically the great fighter that the fleet air arm never had as i've explained in previous dry docks as opposed to the sea fire historically which was obviously adapted from the land spitfire and had a number of issues including a disturbing propensity to break its back after a few rough landings this was right back at the beginning of spitfire development and as you can see from the wing shape, it involves some fairly major structural changes as compared to a Spitfire Mark I or Mark II. But those changes were designed to allow for the aircraft to be a significantly stronger aircraft. So it could actually withstand the force of landings, made visibility a bit better for those landings as well, without sacrificing much, if any, of the performance of the Spitfire itself. So... If you imagine a, you know, a fleet air arm going to war, obviously late 1939, but really getting stuck in in 1940 with early model adapted Spitfires like this instead of skewers, and then in the Mediterranean interceptions taking place again with high performance single seat fighters like Spitfires instead of full Mars, although there probably still would have been some full Mars around for long range fighter duty because obviously the one one of the things with the Spitfire is not the world's longest range fighter. You would have seen a very very different, I think, carrier performance out of the fleet air arm. The reason that the this particular variant was cancelled was initially. Obviously, because it's a Spitfire, it was going to use the Merlin engine. And the RAF said, no, 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 no. We, With war being declared, we need all the Merlin engines we can get our hands on. To be fair, the Fleet Arm did try and keep that go, keep it going for a little while. They said, OK, we're going to, we'll re-engine it, it with something, anything. Um, initially, they were looking at re-engineing it with the Griffin, because the Griffin did actually exist in 3940, just at a, a very early prototype stage, so they were taking a bit of a dice roll on it. And when that was also forbidden for them, they were also looking at other engines, um, including the big radial engines that you'd later see on things like the Tempest. Um, and, yeah, the the idea of you know sticking what would eventually become a 3,000 horsepower engine, or well, 3,000 plus horsepower engine into an airframe, the size and weight of a Spitfire is quite amusing, but eventually the RAF also extended their block booking, if you like, to include any airframes made by Supermarine that were fighter-like. So it meant no matter what engine you put it on, it didn't matter. The RAF wanted the Spitfire production line all to itself. And thus this uh, rather wonderful aircraft never saw the light of day. SFS2040 asks, Why were Enterprise and Saratoga used for mostly night fighters by the end of the war? Was this because they're less capable than the Essexes and thus easier to spare for such a role? Or was there another reason? It was more to do with the circumstances that they found themselves in in the mid to late part of the war rather than specifically capability. Because obviously Enterprise and Saratoga had been on the front lines from pretty much... December 7th and so unlike the Essexes which were only starting to come into service about a year and a half later and obviously some of the later ones even later still 
by 43-44, the Enterprise and Saratoga were both damaged and in serious need of overhaul and refit. Now, when you look at the careers of a lot of the Essex class, they pretty much go out to the front lines in 43-44, and they stay on the front lines until near enough the end of the war in a lot of cases unless they've suffered some kind of major damage and that means that they're cycling air groups occasionally and so forth but most of the time they're only the closest they're getting back to the continental united states is pearl harbor and because they're obviously valuable big modern fleet carriers they're constantly on the front lines constantly undertaking conventional operations although Starting in 1943, small detachments, usually three or four aircraft, of night-capable um, fighters usually are being deployed. But with both Enterprise and Saratoga actually fetching up in the continental United States a number of times, both for initially brief and repair of war damage and wear, just from having been out there longer, and then later on from some pretty hefty damage that they take later in the war, it just so happens that they are in the vicinity of, you know, continental United States, where these new night fighter doctrine and night fighter techniques are being trained. And so they're able to deploy back out to the front lines and take these aircraft with them. Plus, of course, being available um, after they've been fixed, they can train up those air crews in actual carrier operations as opposed to them learning on land or learning on a training carrier. So once you've taken the night fighting fighters and night fighting bombers that the uh, US Navy's been working up, if you've trained them to operate off of Enterprise or you've trained them to operate off of Saratoga, it makes sense to keep them on Enterprise and Saratoga. One, because those ships are going back to the front line, and two, because they are a little bit different to an Essex class. So using... Enterprise or Saratoga basically as a glorified ferry and then dumping these air aircraft and their pilots onto a, a somewhat different carrier and then expecting them to conduct the very difficult night ops with a new crew and with a slightly different layout of ship could lead to some rather worrying casualty counts. And because of, I think it's partly circumstance, therefore, that leads to Enterprise and Saratoga leading the charge when it comes to night fighting aircraft. You can see here this is an F-6FN night fighting Hellcat. You can see there's the radar stuck out on the starboard wing. And that is is basically it, I think. If, if one of the Essexes had been really badly hit um, in mid to late 43 and fetched up back in the U.S., in a similar state to Enterprise or Saratoga, had been repaired and had to spend time working up off the West Coast, then maybe one of the Essex class would have also become a night fighting specialist. But as it turns out, the Essexes that were hit really, really badly um, tend to be things like Franklin and Bunker Hill hit much later in the war. And by the time they're back in the US and then being repaired, it's far too late for active frontline duty again. Rolf S. asks... How do different navies handle battle honours? Are they attached to the actual ship or passed on with the name? It varies massively with the navies in question. Um, as far as I understand it, and bear in mind this is as far as I understand it, the US Navy, for example, doesn't carry battle honours between ships. You have battle stars awarded, but the battle star count resets with every new ship. So, for example, USS Enterprise CV-6 had many battle stars, but USS Enterprise CVN-65 didn't inherit those. Please feel free to correct me, to correct me if I'm wrong, um, US Navy viewers, but that's as far as I understand it. Whereas in the Royal Navy, battle honours are carried by the name of a vessel, which means that, you or a squadron, or a regiment, but obviously we're talking about Navy, um, so we're talking about ships, which in turn means that you can have some ships, if the name has been used relatively uncommonly or has only come into currency relatively recently which have fairly small battle honors boards but you can also have other ships which have extensive battle honors because the name has been reused time and again throughout history and those ships have shown up at some fairly important engagements 
The earliest battle honour that's awarded to Royal Navy ships, incidentally, is the Armada 1588. And you'd be surprised how many ships in the 20th and 21st centuries actually carried the Armada battle honour. Um, Akartes, which was a destroyer in World War II, um, amongst other things, had the Armada battle honour, as did Ark Royal, and of course the more recent Ark Royal, the Invincible Class Carrier. Um, Dreadnought... Uh, there was a dreadnought at um, the Battle of uh, the Armada, well, the Armada campaign. There was also a dreadnought at Trafalgar, which means that HMS Dreadnought herself, although she doesn't carry the Jutland battle honour, does carry both the Armada and Trafalgar battle honours, which will be very interesting when the new submarine is launched. Um, there's also the Revenge, the Swiftshire, the Vanguard, and of course Victory, all of which, and Tiger, all of which are relatively well known as 20th and 21st century Royal Navy warships of various pedigrees, all carrying the Armada, um, the Armada battle honour. Swiftshire, of course, also being another one that can carry both the Armada and Trafalgar battle honours. Ryan Farrell asks, how do iron or steel ships sink from fire damage, especially when there's no massive explosion such as magazine detonation? There's a number of possibilities depending on how the fire develops and where the fire develops. I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, there is a possibility of fire spreading to the magazines, but it, you can also have circumstances such as, well, if the ship's taken enough damage to have a major fire on board, that damage might include damage underwater. So it might have been hit by bombs and torpedoes or maybe just some bombs that have caused leaks below the waterline. Normally, you'd need to patch those, but if the fire either is physically blocking your access to the area to close bulkheads and so forth and destroy the systems that might have automatically done that, combined with perhaps also, you know, the fire is perhaps also damaging or destroying other damage control equipment and the crew that you have to fight the damage, well, then the fire will lead to progressive flooding because you can't get close enough to do anything about it which can then result in the loss of the ship you can also have if you get a really bad enough fire um, fire could destroy enough of the ship in certain locations that you that might compromise the stability of the ship so for example if if the ship's really badly on fire and we're talking this has to be a properly bad fire and there's a really strong wind coming in from one side that might drive the fire to the opposite side but over time therefore the fire might eat away at enough of the upper works and superstructure of the ship whilst the well, the wind side remains relatively intact that the ship might lose stability and capsize then you also have possibility especially if the fire gets deeper in the ship that structural members of the ship might be compromised. And we're not going to get into the whole, oh, whatever temperature to melt steel beams nonsense. The simple fact is that steel or iron beams do get substantially weaker in heat long before they melt. So obviously a ship is a self-supporting structure, but if significant portions of the ship's structure are now compromised in terms of strength you might end up with a ship collapsing in on itself partially and that might then lead to breaches which then lead to it sinking um, you also have things like maybe valves and other th things below the waterline that open out into the sea and if the fire is intense enough those might be warped or heated enough that they open and you get flooding uh, you could also in really catastrophic cases end up with a hole and the whole members becoming so hot that the ship just catastrophically fails so rather than the previous example where you might have you know part of the ship collapsing and that leading to leaks you could in theory have a fire intense enough that there could be a catastrophic failure of the hull especially if the ship's still moving and there's a lot of force being exerted on it and related to that is whilst it would take a truly tremendous fire to cause that kind of failure you can quite quite a lot more easily have fire ripping through the ship collapsing decks and bulkheads because if you've got some heavy equipment mounted higher up in the ship and again you know the the stanchions and such that are holding individual decks up are not going to be as strong as the ribs and structure of the ship itself you can end up with significant loads shifting 
um, and all falling down maybe to one side of a ship or to one end of a ship or whatever and as the ship lists the fire is going to weaken other areas that's going to cause even more failures and now there's already a list so the line of fall is all off to one side anyway and you can end up with capsize that way or if it's a big enough a heavy enough object and the ship's weakened enough if it falls it might even punch a hole in the side of the ship and cause leakage so there's lots and lots of ways for catastrophic fires to make a ship just outright sink caracal asks can you tell us something about the venetian arsenal to me, it looks like the U-boat bunkers, but for 15th century warships. What was the production process? What and how many ships could be built? How were ships stored? What were the differences to other shipyards? And was there any comparable ship factory complex in the world? So, first off, um, this image is uh, courtesy of Christopher Rosa, who managed to get an incredibly high-res, high-detailed picture of the original map that was produced to illustrate the Venetian arsenal way back in the day um, and you can see the full layout of it as it was these days some of it's still there but not all of it um, was there any comparable ship factory complex in the world at the time not in the western world um, I don't know exactly if there might have been something in maybe China around about the period give or take a few centuries but certainly nothing that i've come across in my readings and it, it, yeah, it basically is a warship production factory and it goes back to back back to the age of galleys obviously this particular depiction shows galleys and ships of the line it's a little bit later on um, but it's several centuries in the making um, the venetian arsenal and it's a combination of factors because obviously Venice is a relatively small, almost city-state, uh, although it's, for the, a long period of its history, it is actually a bit bigger than the city itself. But it's a relatively compact political entity. It's very rich, it's very powerful, and it has an in extreme nautical interest, all of which mean that the, the conditions exist for something like this to be made because they need a lot of ships, but they don't have a tremendous amount of space. Um, even somewhere like Britain, which isn't exactly the largest country in the world, or England as it would have been at the time, still has a lot of coast compared to somewhere like Venice. So you can have multiple cities, multiple ports, multiple dockyards, and you don't need the great level of state investment that you do for something like the Venetian Arsenal. In terms of how the ships would be built, well, they follow a little bit of a production line. So over there in the top right, you can see hulls being prepared. So hulls would all be built um, up in, in that section. And especially when it came to galleys, they'd be made with pre-made components, almost an Ikea-style flat-pack galley, all modular parts, all to the same specifications, at least as far as you can do in medieval and Renaissance period manufacture. Those hulls would then be launched um, and be taken out of the basin after they'd been corked, so having um, various seams and everything sealed. Then they'd move into the second basin, where there would be a section which masted them, and then the hulls would be moved along to where they'd be equipped with their weaponry, and then they'd be moved along further around, going in a clockwise motion, where they would then receive ropes, rigging, anchors, oars, all the other extraneous stuff once the main structure and armament had been complete. And then finally you would move out to the left hand side which is where you would receive your sails uh, the last bit of the the ship the motive power and then it would be down the little canal and out into service so quite an efficient little process and it's what allows the venetian navy in part to be such a major player on the world stage in the mediterranean for the time period that it it does because you know you've got the venetian navy is operating a, along the same not the same exactly the same size and power but it's operating in the same ballpark when it comes to things like the battle of lepanto and the crusades as you know the navies of spain or portugal which are you know significantly geographically larger countries than venice is grant lee asks how effective were disappearing batteries like for example at fort monroe because of the nature of technological development at the time that disappearing gun mounts were in vogue, i.e. the late 19th century and very early 20th century, 
their effectiveness is wildly different on almost a half decade by half decade basis. So initially, they seem to offer quite a lot of advantages because it allows you to do away with having to build a massive fortified complex in order to have guns that can then fire out at surface targets because disappearing mounts are almost entirely used in coastal fortifications in a naval context. And instead you can get away with much, much cheaper basic emplacements with lots of earth embankments because the gun then just pops up and then, as the name suggests, disappears again using usually its recoil. And in a period when ships are relatively slow and ranges are relatively short, the fact that they're direct, pretty much direct fire weapons isn't too much of a problem. And also reload times generally are not uh, too bad uh, well they're not too bad in comparison with ships they're pretty awful overall but uh, you know if everyone else is firing at a similarly slow rate it doesn't matter too much the problem with disappearing batteries is that pretty much by the time they're really hitting their stride in terms of efficiency and layout ability to carry large guns ship speeds are increasing rates of fire are increasing ranges are increasing and compared to other types of coastal fortification, the disappearing battery really at that point only has the fact that it's easy to hide as its saving grace. And even then, you know, the advent of things like new generations of monitors and generic high angle fire means that they're actually becoming more and more vulnerable. The biggest problem you have is that compared to other types of coastal fortification, more traditional fixed emplacements or turret emplacements, they're more expensive um, because the mount is more complicated and they can't elevate as much. Sometimes the elevation is comparable with ships at sea, but coastal fortifications generally are able, with the more conventional layouts, are more are able to elevate their guns higher than ships at sea, which gives them a period where they can engage ships without the ships being able to engage them, which is an advantage the disappearing mount usually doesn't have. Um, because apart from anything, if you elevate the gun quite high on a disappearing mount, one, it can affect the balance quite significantly, and two, obviously, when you fire it, the thing's coming down with, you know, the breach pointing quite significantly at the ground, which could be quite bad unless you significantly alter the way the whole thing's laid out and if you're putting massive gun pits around the gun to take account of the um, potential a potential attempt at high elevation then you're obviating a lot of the ability to easily reload the thing they're also somewhat harder to upgrade than more basic mountings so you might have a 12 inch 25 or 12 inch 30 caliber weapon and that might be fine in the 18 early 1890s but by 1905, when you maybe want a 40 or 45 caliber weapon, it's it's a bit easier to re to do that on a conventional uh, emplacement than it is on a disappearing mount. Again, because of the intricate balance issues that go into disappearing mounts. And there's a few other things, as I say. Yeah, ship speed increases the fact that you have to traverse the gun once it's back up in position um, and usually elevate the gun once it's back up in position that means your rate of fire is capped at a lower rate so faster ships with faster rates of fire now have an advantage against you um, and be again because of the size and complexity of the mount the tracking is somewhat slower so a you know a pre-dreadnought or a late ironclad that may be moving at 12 14 knots and is firing at one or two rounds every two or three minutes a disappearing mount is quite happy to engage and probably has a slight advantage over whereas by the early to mid 1900s when ships might be cruising 18 to 20 knots they've got more guns and they're firing at maybe if they're really going for it maybe one round every half a minute and you're restricted to still maybe around a minute round every minute and a half suddenly you're the one at a disadvantage especially with you know electrical and hydraulically operated turrets that might be able to track in on you a lot faster than you can track in on, on your new fast moving opponent and of course whilst you may have a slight elevation and therefore a slight range advantage assuming you're using a similar gun to the one your opponent is using 
as we see in the First World War, even if you don't have a dedicated monitor or bombardment ship available, captains can get very inventive and do things like flood the tanks down or one side of the ship and cause the ship to um, roll or to heal it more accurately. And that artificially increases the elevation of their guns and that can allow a ship with limited elevation to dramatically increase the range of its weapons to a point that perhaps it can comfortably outrange a gun on a disappearing mount. Uh, as I said, practical about examples of that seen all throughout the First World War, which, uh, for reasons I've already explained, a, a disappearing mount can't do. So, effectively, you're looking at the range revolution that happens at the turn of the 20th century. Before that, disappearing batteries are probably relatively effective, after that, against modern opposition, i.e. late pre-dreadnoughts, early dreadnoughts, their efficiency drops off quite dramatically. Reva asks, The development of carrier flight decks took a great many starts and stops based on technical limitations or optimisms of the time. However, once it was established that flat top with an island was the way to build a dedicated aircraft carrier, was there anything be beyond, why didn't I think of that before, that led to the innovation of angle flight decks taking so long to appear. It comes down to operational need and aircraft carrier size evolving. So one of, if not the biggest advantage of an angle flight deck is that it allows a aircraft to have an extended landing area um, because it's not running into aircraft that are preparing to set off. And B, it means that if something does go wrong, it's got space to pull away and try again. Again, as opposed to a straight deck carrier where you would either end up plowing into a safety net, a safety rope, or aircraft parked up ahead of you. But back in the earlier days, 1920s and early 1930s, that wasn't really so much of a problem. Aircraft were smaller, they were slower, their landing speeds were a lot slower, and so you didn't need the length of landing strip that an angle flight deck gave you. And if you somehow did end up, you know, going a bit overshoot, overshot, as mentioned before, you'd end up running into a cable or a net and, I mean, there'd be some damage, but it wouldn't be too dramatic. As opposed to 10, 15 years later, when you're talking about extreme high performance piston powered aircraft or early jets, where everything could get very messy very quickly and there was no necessary guarantee that um, nets or ropes would be able to actually stop you in time in the first place. The other aspect was that bigger, heavier aircraft needed longer run-ups to take off as well as longer areas to touch down, and so by offsetting these two areas, the angle flight deck allows you to continue to conduct takeoff and landing operations in the mid to late 1940s and beyond context without having to suspend one or the other because you know you can only do one or the other on a straight angle flight deck. There is an outside issue as well, a much less important one, to be honest, compared to the other those, the other ones we've just spoken about, which is that if you have a big enough carrier and a steep enough angle on your flight deck, then regardless of the fact your aircraft are bigger and heavier, you can actually launch aircraft off of the angle part of the flight deck as well as off of the bow, which can increase your sortie rate. But that only comes into play at a point where you have so many aircraft aboard that you need to sortie them a lot faster than you could do with a conventional straight through deck on carriers of the 20s and 30s. So effectively there wasn't a ship size suitable or a need f for an angled flight deck for the most part during the 20s and 30s. Now you can make an argument some of the bigger conversions like the Lexingtons for example or maybe the Shikakus as as built, they might have benefited from an angled flight deck in terms of being able to send off more aircraft more quickly. That's true, but the sing as we said before, the single biggest advantage was not was the fact that it meant you could continue simultaneous flight and recovery operations, and on either a Lexington or a Shikaku, with the aircraft that they were carrying up until the end of the Second World War, you could do that just fine without an angled flight deck. Ryan Yip asks, recently discovered the open-air bridge of the US Alaska class cruisers. Is this a common trend found on larger warships? 
Yep, this is a common trend on pretty much all warships up until the point where radar and other sensors become the dominant form of how you get your information. As long as visual spotting is very important, open bridges remain a thing. And there's a reason I'm showing you this footage, which I took aboard HMS Cavalier at Chatham Dockyard last year. This is the open bridge of the destroyer with a small weather covering put in place. And that's typical weather covering you might find in certain circumstances. But as you can hopefully see as we come back round, the amount of visibility you have, even through what's actually an open sides, is very low as compared to now. And very, this is a camera. The human eye has a much better field of view. Now you can see a much, much larger portion of the horizon. And that is a huge thing, especially when you're talking about aircraft spotting, which obviously um, you know, they're up in the sky. But even just more generally, any kind of covering of the bridge, even a weather cover like this, is a huge restriction on your ability to see what's going on around you. And a an fully enclosed bridge where obviously you're going to have windows as opposed to just open sides like this is even more of a visual restriction. For those of you in the south southern part of the UK, if you ever get to go on HMS Belfast, you will be able to see this if you look around London from the open bridge on the top of Belfast and then you go a level down onto one of the enclosed bridges. And as you can see here, we're now under the enclosed section. The amount that you can see is dramatically different. Carter asks, my 12 year old son has a question. He wants to know if pirates in the 14th to 18th century really fought the way they do in the movies. Did they really swing on ropes to board other ships and use pistols and sword on deck in big battles? And most important, did they all have pet parrots on their shoulder while doing so? So the answers to those three are qualified yes, yes and no. Um, in terms of pistols and swords on deck in a big boarding action, yes, that's very definitely a thing that happened. Pirate ships, counter to the myth, generally wouldn't prefer to do that because there's not that many of them so if they get in a really stiff boarding action even a handful of casualties could be quite detrimental to their overall crew but if they have to they're perfectly willing to do so um, so it's it's not a first choice tactic and they'd prefer to just shoot at them a bit at the enemy a bit with their guns with a cannon and hope the enemy surrenders but if they don't then they've got no real problem with boarding actions either swinging on ropes to board other ships um qualified yes grappling hooks with ropes attached to them definitely are a thing but they're usually used to haul the two ships together or to give some kind of way to get across because ships decks are often quite close to each other one of the problems when you look at a boarding action where people are swinging on ropes i mean yes it looks fantastic but two things tactically speaking you're making yourself a rather predictable target if someone on the other ship with a musket or a pistol or even a long pokey device like a boarding pike if they see you coming they also know where you're going to be in the next couple of seconds so they can line up a shot or prepare a very pointy welcome for you um, or if they don't have anything like that they can still see roughly where you're going to land so they can just be waiting for you with a sword and while you're still trying to cope with the process of landing they can be cutting you to pieces so there are a number of tactical disadvantages to just randomly swinging in on ropes the other thing is where are these ropes hanging from um, because you're not throwing a grappling hook. I don't care how many hours you've spent at sea. You're not throwing a grappling hook with enough force for it to snag up on somebody's yards. You know, the cross pieces to the mast. Um, not unless you're on a very, very small ship, at which point you could just you know step over. Um, but, I mean, I suppose in theory you could catch some of the rigging. Um... But whether I'd trust a whether I'd trust that to swing on, and b whether the rope's just going to get the rope itself is going to get tangled up in the rigging as well, you know, probably not the best of ideas. The only real way you're going to be swinging over on ropes from one ship to another is if you've already hung a bunch of ropes for the purpose of swinging over to the enemy ship from your own yards because they'll overhang. Then you could go for it. Um, you'd also have to have somewhere relatively high to launch yourself from because there's going to be a you know 
the the bottom of your swing so you'd be launching yourself off of the quarter deck or in an earlier earlier parts of the age of sail the forecastle and maybe maybe if there's some severed rigging you could do an impromptu swing across or something like that um so i'm not saying it didn't happen um and if you could somehow organize a mass swing across assault in as part of an assault that also included a more conventional uh, attack across the gunwales or gunnels, then at that point you might you might get away with it. Um, so perhaps if I don't know if if the if the, you've already got a boarding action going underway and there's a lot of fighting on the main deck and you notice that the ship's officers and most of the ship's crew that were on the quarter deck or on the poop deck aft have headed down the stairs and are mainly interested in that element then yeah if a few people swinging across from the equivalent deck on your side behind them to strike the enemy colors and attack them from behind that has a limited advantage but for the most part you're going to want to be doing something slightly less suicidal than a rope swing um and as far as pet parrots on their shoulder whilst fighting no um <laughs> they did have pet parrots but no sane parrot is going to hang around on somebody's shoulder while there's smoke and gunfire and sword blades flashing all around it. Um, it they're either going to be... They, well, they're either going to just fly off themselves and probably settle themselves high up in the ship's rigging until it's all over, or, because they're relatively valuable and rare creatures, um, probably actually have been locked below with other valuable things by the pirates themselves before the fight begins. Elvia asks, I've heard the 1920s built cruiser Emden was intended to be built with 850mm guns in twin turrets, but apparently the Allied Disarmament Authority refused to permit this armament. Instead, she was armed with leftover 150mm 45 caliber guns in single turrets, as were of previous cruisers of World War I. Why were twin mounts denied when other nations at the time had twin mounts of similar, if not larger, caliber? It was all part of the, well, Germany, you're not allowed to have nice things anymore trend that was running through the Versailles Treaty and, and other enforced agreements with Germany at the end of World War One. Because, as you say, yes, other people did have twin turrets in cruiser caliber guns, approximately. Others would experiment with them shortly thereafter. But as far as the Allies were concerned, Germany wasn't allowed to have anything nice anymore, and that included... Well, at the time, to be fair, would have been a fairly advanced light cruiser design, having uh, all its main arm in twin turrets. And thus, it basically is just because Germany. Bear in mind, obviously, that you know everybody had dreadnoughts and super dreadnoughts at this point, but the, the Allies were also saying to Germany, not only are you not allowed dreadnoughts, uh, only allowed to have half a dozen pre-dreadnoughts, but when you replace them, you can only replace them with 10,000 tonne or less ships, which means there was absolutely no way, according to the treaty impositions on Germany, that they would ever be able to build anything approximating a modern battleship ever again. Of course, we know that that didn't eventually work out, and 1930s Germany went on to do so, but, you know, the Emden being denied a weapons type that everybody else already either had or was about to experiment with wasn't the harshest of the in naval penalties the allies imposed aerospace gaming asks regarding the loss of uss arizona i've heard several times that the ship's keel was broken by the ship impacting the bottom of the harbor not the explosion does this hold any truth um it depends how you define when it impacted the bottom of the harbor because as you will have seen from the uh, footage of Arizona exploding in the video, you know, you can, I mean, one of it's one of the things that Michael Bay's Pearl Harbor film got mostly right. The entire front of Arizona basically leapt out of the water and flexed before collapsing back down again. Now, by most reasonable standards, if you take the bow of a ship the size of Arizona, bear in mind that aft of the uh, funnel's she didn't really flex and basically the whole thing is just whipped like that so quickly that's 99 percent certain when the keel broke um and uh, you could maybe make an argument that if the steel was being particularly cooperative that day and had gone and and was still intact somehow 
that maybe then as the uh, bow fell back down again and slammed into the bottom at that point perhaps that finished off the keel or broke the keel maybe but i think i'd argue that uh, the keel leaping unexpectedly several dozen feet into the air probably would have snapped it already um but even if that happens that's still a result of the explosion of it being violently slammed back down again um by the time that video ends arizona's keel is well and truly broken um if the implication is that the keel was intact and then the ship settled on the bottom and that's what broke its keel then no i would say from an engineering and a history standpoint there's pretty much a 99.99999 percent chance of that not being in any way shape or form true um that explosion impacted imparted far 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 more energy to the bow part of arizona's keel than settling the few feet of pearl harbor's water that it would have had to to hit the bottom could ever have done plus also you know there's a bunch of other case studies right there of ships from nevada to california to west virginia all of which sank in pretty much the same depth of water and none of which broke their keels in doing so so yeah it, it's the explosion Vintage Car History asks, I recently saw a photo of the crew of HMS Utmost, a British submarine of World War II vintage. I understand it's the only British vessel given that name. Is there anything else interesting about this boat? Well, I mean, she has a relatively short career. She's a U-class sub, so she's a relatively small vessel, barely over 500 tonnes on the surface, um, coming into service in World War Two, in the middle of 1940, she's sunk in November 1942, so she's only in service for about just a fraction over two years, the vast majority of which is spent in the Mediterranean. For a small sub, and obviously when you're talking about Royal Navy subs, not in quite the same kind of target-rich environment as Catalina U-boats, she does relatively well for herself, by all accounts. She either is directly or jointly responsible for sinking eight ships and damaging three more, including a Italian cruiser in the damage category, which is, is, is not a bad accomplishment for the time and place that she's operating. There's also some indication she might have taken part in special operations, but that particular aspect of her her career either hasn't been fully explored yet if the archive documents saying what she did are, are accessible or possibly they may still be sealed um so i guess there's a maybe a little bit of mystery hanging over that but then she's um sunk on the way back from a mission by an italian torpedo boat as i said in november 42 so that's the end of her career at which point yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's probably the most interesting aspect would be what exactly was she doing in these uh, special operations missions, which is maybe something, as I say, it could be that the files have been released and they're just sitting somewhere in queue and haven't been archived um, or no one's looked at them yet. Um, it might also still be sealed. Some sort of World War Two stuff still is. Um Maybe I'll go and have a poke around next time I'm in the archive, see if I can find something. Although, of course, this being Q, there is also a small possibility that it's been misfiled and some lucky person looking up, I don't know, chocolate ration sizes for 1946 will come across a mysterious special operations file. Class A Cornet asks, could the Nelsons with an upgraded power plant ever reach 28 knots, uh, rebuilt small tube Queen Elizabeth style? Theoretically, possibly. Um, her hull speed is somewhere in the low to mid 30s of knots, so 28 knots isn't inconceivable from a hull performance design, and she's got a fairly efficient hull anyway, um, although obviously it's not the speed that her hull was designed for. <laughs> now, um, but her boiler room space is broadly, a, not entirely, but they're within a ballpark of the approximate floor space of the boiler spaces of uh, King George V, which we know could make 28 knots. They're about the same kind of displacement, except that the King George V is able to kick out well more than twice the horsepower. So 
if you're doing a complete wholesale boiler machinery replacement, I'm pretty sure you could find the power plant to kick the Nelsons from 23 to 28 knots on paper. And as I say, the hull doesn't stop you from doing that. The single biggest restriction with getting the Nelsons up to 28 knots is that they are only two shaft ships, which is going to pose some interesting issues with cavitation and the engines, two engines being able to take all the necessary shaft horsepower. So that would be my biggest concern. Um, if you can find a prop shaft and screw combination, and to be honest, a turbine combination that can take the sort of 100, 110,000 shaft horsepower you're probably going to need through two screws to get it then and survive without disintegrating, then yes, in theory, I don't see any other major problem in terms of boiler or hull design to getting the Nelsons up to 28 knots. But that's a fairly large caveat to hang over the whole idea. Torreno asks, It's been mentioned in previous episodes how many obsolete ironclads or similar ships were still in service or reserve as late as the 1890s or early 1900s before being scrapped under Jackie Fisher. My question is, why were these ships kept in service for so long? Was it a holdover from the age of sail where a ship could render service for decades or just a case of whomever was in charge not wanting to be seen as reducing the Royal Navy? And did it cause an outcry at the time? Having seen records in Hansard in favour of wooden ships as late as 1867, I can imagine ill-informed politicians or members of the public dec decrying the scrapping of these still useful ships. Well, from one Nelson to another, here's the late 19th century version of HMS Nelson. Um, there's a number of reasons, not all of them good, as to why a lot of these ships were kept around. Part of it was... Yeah, a little bit of a holdover from the days when you just having ships in reserve was fine and you know, a ship that had been in reserve for 10, 15 years would still give useful service. Part of it was also it made numbers m look more impressive. And I know that's a really, really poor reason, but it was something that was cited um, by a few people at one point in defense of keeping them when Fisher wanted to get rid of them all, basically saying it makes the Royal Navy look more impressive and therefore they're people less likely to challenge us if we, on paper, have six, seven, eight, nine hundred ships on the books. To which Fisher promptly pointed out that, you know, yeah, maybe for stupid people, but if we're up against a serious opponent, they'll actually look at that and realize what exactly the story is. Um, part of it was also the idea that Whilst perhaps these older ships wouldn't be of any particular use in a frontline combat role against a peer opponent, they might be able to take up the slack of other ships that were more useful. Uh, so the idea being that if the newer, more modern ships are available in fewer numbers, but generally have to be out and about policing the entirety of the British Empire... If you suddenly find you're having to pull them all into one particular area of operations to fight a major opponent, like, say, the concentration of force that preceded World War I, then there might be some percentage in taking over colonial and other foreign stations with these older reserve ships, because in theory the Royal Navy's main battle strength will keep the enemy's entire battle strength locked up closer to wherever it is they're fighting, and thus having any ship present overseas elsewhere will allow for colonial duties to be undertaken, stop rebellions from happening, allow the flag to be shown, etc., etc. And the fact that they can't actually fight anything modern doesn't matter because they're not going to be fighting anything modern. They're just going to be keeping the locals under control. Um, so, yeah, it was an idea, I guess. Um, and to be fair, compared to some of the third class cruisers that were sent around, it probably wasn't an awful one, to a limited degree at least. <laughs> um, I mean, th there's not much that would have done worse than HMS Pegasus did um, in the in the western part of the Indian Ocean, even if it was an 1880s ironclad. Plus, there were there were some ideas about potentially rearming the ships to make them a bit more useful. HMS Hercules, the ironclad, again being an example where they thought, well, yeah, it's a central battery ironclad, but maybe if we put some modern breech loaders in it, it will at least have the firepower. So 
yeah, its iron armor might not be fully up to the spec of the latest guns, but again, if you're talking about armed merchant raiders or very small protected cruisers, then possibly a merchant protecting heavy ironclad with modern guns would be able to see them off. Again, not exactly the world's wisest solution, but a reason that was given. And then finally, one of the other things is almost a very... Uh, a very negative, pessimistic outlook, um, almost along the lines of I don't uh, of um, I don't know what weapons World War Three will be fought with, but I know World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones. Kind of outlook, which was there. Some people within the Royal Navy were genuinely worried that in the event of a full-on knockdown, drag-out war, potentially with multiple different nations at once the entire modern fighting strength of the Royal Navy might well be destroyed. Hopefully it would take the entire modern fighting strength of the enemy down with it. But then, so the logic went, if the Royal Navy could then bring up second and third tranche reserve ships that against modern com opponents would be completely obsolete, but now had no modern opponents, then they would retain control of the seas by dint of being the only ship still left afloat with any kind of firepower. Again, not particularly brilliant thinking, but something that is found in historical documents. So um, it was kind of a confluence of all these different ideas. No one particularly large party within the Royal Navy or the British government had an overall kind of dominance as to exactly why they were keeping these old ships around. But there was a general consensus that even if everybody thought everybody else was wrong about why they were doing so the one thing they were kind of agreed on is that they probably should keep them around, uh, so at least until Fisher came along and pointed out how stupid this idea was. Miko Leitnan asks, Did the Marines during the Age of Sail use linear warfare tactics in repelling boarding actions, aka when the enemy boarding action is imminent, um, form up a double or triple line on the opposite side of the deck and unleash a fury on anybody coming over? Not usually, for a couple of reasons, and I'm going back to this uh, particular photo again of uh, the uh, boarding action simulation I did now at uh, Fight Camp. Now, obviously, this is not involving firearms, but it does illustrate some of the points. Firstly, you do not want your enemy on your deck. That is something you want to stop at all possible costs, so you have to have your own counter-boarding melee people closer up and firing through your own people is generally seen as a bad call so um, that's one of the problems um, another problem is quite often your marines are some of your best trained fighters so having them away from the point of the boarding action again is something of a problem uh, thirdly bunching up all of your marines in a double or triple line, yes, it might allow you to unleash a couple of nasty musket volleys on the borders coming across, but if they see you doing that, they're likely to hold off for a second behind the gunnels of the ship, which can probably stop a musket ball, and ask somebody very nice on their own ship to, you know, discharge a 12-pounder or a 24-pounder carronade full of uh, grape shot into your nice neat line and basically wipe out your entire marine contingent in a single salvo. And then the final part, as was being demonstrated here, is actually the best formation to deal with borders is a kind of bent line, because then you can receive the borders into a little kettle area where you can stab them to death, rather than a straight line where they can kind of batch you one on one and then you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, the other issue is that unless the boarding is taking place at a very, very specific point, which in this particular exercise at this timestamp it was, the enemy boarding party is unlikely to be concentrated enough for a few salvos of musket fire to have a meaningful effect. They're going to try and ideally board over as wide a range of length as possible in order to make you defend as many points as possible. And kind of coupled to the fact if you're bunched up, you're vulnerable to, you know, a cannon or carronade unleashing a bunch of uh, grape shot or canister at you. The flip side is that... Um, Whilst on land, a vo several volleys of concentrated musket fire might be quite lethal, if you need 
heavy volleys of concentrated firepower, you're actually much better off on a naval ship of the Age of Sail period just asking someone with a swivel gun or a light cannon to do the job for you in a single blast rather than, you know, bunch up and form a target. So the Marines generally would be more spread out and where they did cluster, they would tend to be clustering around points of the ship that were specifically um, called for when it came to defence. So the ship's wheel... Um, the passage up to the quarter deck or poop deck to the ship's flag and the officers. Paul Christian Thompson asks, after having both our navy stolen and capital bombarded during the Napoleonic Wars, I'm a Dane if you hadn't already guessed, uh, there was continual low intensity warfare in the Danish waters. How much of the Royal Navy's resources were tied up in these waters in terms of ships and garrisons etc? It's relatively difficult to quantify for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the time period of hostilities between Denmark, Norway and Britain coincides with a period of hostilities between Russia and Britain, for the most part. And so some of the ships that are involved are passing through on their way to or from the Baltic for other operations and just happen to get involved. So it's not really Royal Navy resources tied up specifically in Danish waters as more of going through to another conflict. Plus you have convoys that are escorted through to Sweden and um, and a few other destinations for uh, the, under less official pretenses in the Baltic. And again, those convoys would have had to have been escorted partially against Russian interference, partially against French interference as anyway. So again, if they get caught up fighting mostly Danish gunboats on their way through is that Royal Navy resources being tied up by because specifically of the Danish uh, conflict or is that Royal Navy resources that would be passing the area anyway getting caught up in the conflict now to be sure there were some Royal Navy ships everything from brigs and frigates to small ships of the line that were sent in specifically to deal with various threats due to the few surviving Danish ships of the line, frigates, and mostly the, the gunboats. But it's a relatively small number. The vast majority of interactions are either general patrol craft or craft, as I said, that were either potentially or definitively involved in other aspects of the war as well. Plus, um, just general Royal Navy patrols all over the place to try and hunt down and capture... French and other privateers and of course Danish privateers now that there's hostilities going on so disentangling all of that and trying to work out on a ship by ship basis you know which ones are there specifically because of Denmark and which ones are there just in the more general term can be very difficult but as a as an average based on on what I've read you're probably looking at a couple of, do I, I think, a couple of dozen ships, if you count from Briggs upwards, specifically allocated to the area, but several times that many passing through at any given stage in the conflict for a given year. And that wraps up this week's Trydoc. Thank you very much for listening. Um, no particular channel admin of note this week, except to say that I am working with the various museum ships that we're going to be visiting in on the US trip, and I'm hoping to advise on precise details of when, where, and how, if you are coming to those ships the days I'm going to be there, how we can meet up safely without people getting annoyed with us. So that should be pending. Um, any updates I get obviously will be on the website at the uh, <laughs> the page dedicated to the trip thus far. Thank you very much for listening, and see you again in another video.